Welcome to episode 206 of the Barcelona Podcast, home to the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community. Brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network and sponsored betonline.ag. I'm Dan Hilton, and I'm again joined by Frances Tomas, Barca columnist featured on ESPN, Barca Blog, and many others. Frances, so on the weekend, Barca beat Alaves 5-0. Since then, Messi and Kike Setien had a good chat, the players have gone on vacation, and there was never any problems at all. What were we even talking about? There's, there's no problems at Barcelona, Frances. Hola, cules. No, this is going to be the shortest episode in the history of um, the Barcelona podcast, nearly three years, and this episode is about to finish. Thank you and good night. Yeah, it's going to be great. They're prepping for Napoli and all those things, but in all reality, we're going to be quickly hitting Barca Deportivo Alaves, mainly as the end of the Liga season. So we're going to kind of recap a little bit of the bright spots, and I think we know all the negative things that happened in the Liga this year. So we're going to go over some of the bright spots first, and then we're going to hit the Kike Setien rumors and maybe another manager who could be coming in for just one year. And then we're going to talk a little strategy and looking ahead to Barca B, who by the time you have this in your ears, they play tomorrow. But I also want to recap a little bit of the Valladolid Bay and the things that I saw watching that match. And then we're going to end the show by going over again, talking Messi and Suarez, which is what people always want to hear about as well. So stick around to the end of the show for that. And before we get started with this edition of La Ronda, of course, our listener questions from the Facebook group help us get these questions going, starting the conversation, so we always appreciate them. There's also a community that is continuing to grow on YouTube. So as far as those who are interested in La Masia, that we, that being Frances and I, don't really get into too much. You'll hear me go on my tangents now and again. But if you really want a deep dive of some of the better players that impressed me, from December on, which I know there was a big layoff, but the basically the second five. I did one in December, and I did another one now over the summer, basically totaling the 10 players in La Masia this year that have really impressed me and that I do believe have some chance to get into the first team. So that video is up on YouTube. I put it up yesterday, so check that out, and then hop on back here to enjoy this podcast, which starts with a quick recap of Barca Deportiva Alaves, where it was a 5 nothing destruction of Alaves for Barca. And I think the only talking point here, Frances, other than Fati, Puj, and Araujo that we're going to talk about later, Puj being fantastic, Fati scoring his eighth goal in all competition, four of which were the first goals in the game, nerves of steel from him. But the fact that Fati and Puj played so loose, I think that's the talking point. Not about them, but about that once Barca were out of the title race, it seems like a giant weight was lifted off of them. And they played fluid, and they played arguably their best match of the season, which is unfortunate because it was the one and only time they had no pressure on them. For sure. Um, I think that Barca finally showed what they could do. Uh, but as, as I have been saying, you need to be cautious. Um, Alaves were already you know, finished with the season, as were Barca. There was no responsibility, really. That's why the game was played at a different time. And yeah, so Barca were there sort of preparing for the games that come ahead. Um, obviously, there's a big break before the Napoli game. Players, as you said at the beginning, are now on holiday. And uh, yeah, the most positive thing is that Ansu Fati and Ricky Puig had a lot of playing time, like they have been deserving, especially the last two and a half months of post-lockdown, let's, let's call it that. Um, I think Messi, not that he redeemed himself in any way, but he felt, he felt happier. He was smiling even, you know, we haven't seen Messi smile for so many months. Uh, and it was great to see. And yeah, you know, it was a game to finish the season. Um, obviously, we didn't win La Liga. Um, there have been many reasons for that in the previous. I don't really want to go into those today. Um, all the previous podcasts are full of those and quite a bit of moaning from us, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, I just want to be positive looking ahead. Um, the, the youngsters, it's not just they, they can help the first team. I think they're now essential for the first team. Um, obviously, both Ricky and Ansu are now in Dinamica de Premier Equipo, which is the dynamics of the first team. They're not really being allowed to even go and help uh, Barcelona B in their promotion to Segunda División. Um, you can argue that that's what the club needed, but, uh, you know, big money talks. And those two players are now essential squad players um, when we really don't have that many squad players left because, you know, I think there's probably one or two players all season that haven't really got injured. And um, these two are fit, they are fresh, and they are the difference makers, obviously, next to Messi as well. And I don't think Barca, at this moment in time, can afford for them to pick up even a, a tiny sniffle on the preparations for Napoli. Yeah, again, we'll hit Araujo a little later with Barca B, which he'll be taking part, well, tomorrow, whenever you have this in your ears. But Araujo also really impressed me in terms of 
how that game went down and showing something. And, you know, with the last match of the season, with the title race over, I'm just looking for anything to grasp onto straws with. And they came out this week There was where he was considered the fastest, as far as, like, timing his speed, his sprint. He was the fastest defender in all of the Liga, which is pretty incredible. He And you could see that he just has a different way about it. His timing, and we know that PK is a world-class defender who has his timing and his precision down to the letter and his leadership abilities and all those things. But Araujo was able to, even though his positioning isn't as good, he has this dynamic speed that's able to catch up with counterattacks. And so Alaves didn't really have any answer as far as on the counter. And Araujo snuffed out. There was two big chances in particular. And we have over on the YouTube channel, I have the tactical breakdown. So you can see that even with the, the minute marked and all those pictures and things like that. The only other stat here, and I'm going to move on from the Deportiva Alaves game, was that Puj created three big chances. And the, the interesting stat there is that he's the first non-Messi player to have created three big chances or more in a game for Barcelona since Luis Suarez did it in April of 2018, which I don't know if this is a... I, I, I think it's both. I think things can be two things, as Total Soccer Show always says, but Puj is a compliment to him because you just see in the advanced metrics as well the impact that he has on Barca's fluidity, on their passing, and the opportunities that he does create for the attack. The more alarming stat is that it took until three years of time, it took since April 2018, for another player who wasn't Messi to really take over the team and create for teammates and create opportunities and create offense. And that is a worrying sign, to say the least. Well, it just depends whether you want to see the cup half full or half empty. Um, unfortunately, in this situation, I think it's it's a very negative point to highlight that the fact that for so many months, I want to say around two years' time now, um, Barca have depended on Messi even more. I mean, Messi has always been an influential player from the very beginning. I remember him debuting with Ronaldinho and obviously with um, Deco and Eto and all of those around him. And he was an influential player from the world go. The same way like Ansu Fati is being now, but obviously you don't want to say this is the second coming of Messi because you would just ruin the guy. But I see glimpses of, of Ansu in what Messi used to do. And fast forward, what, 15, 16 seasons, and Messi is just too alone. Um, he seems to be doing tirando del carro, like um, what Luis Aragonés told Raul to do with the Spanish national team, um, which is obviously uh, pushing the team forward. Um, but he does it in a very sort of um, individualistic way, not because he wants to be playing by himself. It's because the others just tend to sort of relate to him far too often. There are too many attacking plays that end up going not necessarily just through Messi, which is natural, but back to Messi at the end. And that's just far too predictable to, to see someone of the character and the quality and talent and, and desparpajo, which is um, not respect for hierarchies, that... Um, both Ansu and definitely Ricky Puch in this sense have, is, um, is a breath of fresh air. And that's why we have been saying for many, many years in this podcast, if you trust La Masia, they will respond. They may not be the best players in the world when they debut, but if you trust them and you nurture them and you, you allow them to risk take, these players have got a much, much greater ceiling. I mean, I don't want to digress here, but Sergio Roberto in midfield was very, very good. He was one of our most um, influential players moving forward. I like his runs when he's in possession. I like how he can, he can conduct the ball on his feet and break different lines. And he just adds something different that others, such as in, in the last game, for example, Rakitic or Vidal, etc., they couldn't really do. And, and that is what the La Masia players can do. These, these guys understand the Barca system inside out. It's part of their DNA. I know it's, it's like a cliche to say the Barca DNA, but it really is. The system, the Barca system, the Barca mechanisms, the passing, the outlets, the, the, the pushing, the, all of that, the, the, the fast recovery of the ball, all of those elements are part of who these players are. And if you allow them to shine, the team has a much, much higher ceiling than buying, I don't know, Andrea Gomez is for 40 million euros. That is not the way forward and it can never be. Yeah, and I think from this season, I hope that in the future, five, ten years down the road, we remember that this was the season when Fati and Puj broke in. And that'll be and continue to be the big talking point here. That's the positive. The negative, obviously, of this Liga season was that Barca found reasons enough, even though they should have done it beforehand. They found reasons enough to get rid of Ernesto Valverde halfway through, replacing with Kike Setien. And neither manager did well enough to take home the Liga. You can, again, put blame on everybody around. And Stefano does ask, if you can narrow it down, 
What would be your one takeaway from this league season? How can that transfer over to the Champions League and actually Liga? And I think those are actually two different questions. So we're going to just start with the what is the one takeaway from this La Liga season? And Frances, I'll let you go first. Okay, uh, the one takeaway of the season is what I just said, that Messi is no longer 25 years old. Um, and despite, and, and I, I think, you know, there are some media outlets that seem to be disagreeing with this lately, but I don't think there is any disagreements to be had. Messi is still the best player in the world. He's the most influential player in the world. Um, he had, what, 25 goals and 21 assists. That's more assists than anybody. And that is a much, that is more goals than anybody in the Spanish league. So um, whether people like it or not, he's the most influential player in the world. And um, unfortunately, he's not 25 anymore. He can decide games, but he cannot win games by himself any longer. Or at least he cannot win games with the, um, let's just say, with the team of players he had around him this season, which um, obviously were aging, they weren't fresh, they weren't dynamic, and they weren't necessarily, I want to say, at some points of the season. At the end, I think they were, but at most points of the season, especially around the December, January, February mark, they weren't necessarily hungry enough to... To, to put their effort where, where it needed to be. And uh, yeah, that's my biggest takeaway. Messi cannot win games by himself. And the players that the club have decided to have around him, they just went fit enough, both mentally and physically, to, to, to get the job done. Yeah, we didn't talk about this before we began the show today. And I kind of do have to agree with you that I, I know it seems trite to do the same thing that all the big publications and media that doesn't regularly cover Barca, but they only cover Barca when Messi's in the headlines or for some reason because that's what helps get clicks. But I think as long as Messi is around, Messi should continue to be the one takeaway from, I think, the entire La Liga season even. It seems to me, and it was, it's an interesting thing that there's a conversation. Obviously, again, there has to be some kind of dialogue. There has to be some kind of debate going on or else people aren't going to be paying attention to media, sure. But this idea that Karim Benzema was anywhere close to Messi this season, I think is still an absurd idea. The fact that Messi, as the captain of Barca, we're going to blame him because he couldn't push Barca over the line. And I guess, unfortunately, it is a credit to Karim Benzema and Sergio Ramos, who two of the most hated players for all of Kules. But they're two players that together, I think, were able to limp Real Madrid over the line. Again, it wasn't a dominating La Liga win at all. Over the last decade, I think they've beaten Barca by a combined 17 points. And Barca won the Liga by 19 total points last season under Ernesto Valverde in a year that Barca thought they should get rid of their manager. And that just tells you the margins that Messi allows Barca to operate in. And I also want to remind you that Messi missed the first month of the season, but yet he still had 25 goals to win the Pichichi. His seven times doing that. Again, do not take Messi for granted. I say the same thing about any of the, the top, top guys you ever watch when you're watching Michael Phelps swim or with LeBron James at basketball right now or Michael Jordan when he played. Do not take these goats for granted. He beat Telmo Zara's record. It was only a matter of time that he would do that for his seventh Pichichi. But just, I, I want to go over to wrap up this point about Messi, those final stats there. He had 25 goals. We keep saying that. Benzema had 21. So yeah, he was hot on his heels and helping Madrid capture the title. Gerard Moreno, actually a really good back, uh, bounce back season for him with Villarreal while his former club Espanyol getting relegated. Suarez had 16, which unfortunately is his lowest output since his debut season, which if you remember, he could not play because of the transfer ban for part of that. So uh, we'll go. We'll talk about Suarez at the end of the show. Don't you worry. And then Raul Garcia. We all know how much uh, Kule is would love Romo Garcia of Athletic Club as well. He had 15. Assist-wise, Messi had 21, which is 10 more than the next closest player, which is Oral Zabal for Real Sociedad. He had 11. Santi Cazola, who play, he'll be under Xavi's tutelage in Qatar, but beautiful to see his La Liga career end with Villarreal. Anyway, he had 9, Benzema had 8, and Suarez also added 8, so I guess a good sign for him. But combining those numbers, Messi had 46 combined goals and assists, Benzema had just 29, and Suarez was actually third on that list with 24. It just tells you, it just reminds you, and I don't need advanced metrics. Those are just goals and assists. It tells you that his impact offensively is so much more than everyone around him in the Liga. And on the other side of things, to finalize this point before we hit a break, Ter Stegen also had 450 minutes without conceding uh, a goal, which was his new record. So as leaky as the defense was, Ter Stegen still, for a year that we felt like the defense wasn't as good as it was, particularly last year under Ernesto Valverde, for the step back that the total defense took, Ter Stegen was statistically just as good, putting in shutouts and helping Barcelona have the lead in La Liga for much of the season. So again, the guys who under Ernesto Valverde were the top two guys, 
for Barca, they continued to be that this season, and that did not stop under Kike Setien, a man that we will be talking about after the break. So even though Kike Setien defeated the mighty Deportivo Alaves 5-0, his job is still in jeopardy. He's still on the hot seat, so we had plenty of questions from about Kike Setien from the listeners. Ramon asked, do you want Setien to continue, or do you want to see another coach? And do you think if he continues, they will listen to him next season, or that has that dynamic changed? Dirk says, I'll follow up. Has the Setien experiment officially failed? And Richard also adds, do we think Barca stand a better chance of progressing in the Champions League with a caretaker in charge? And this week, we've also seen the two rumors that we'll get into about Patrick Kluivert. That was the beginning of the week. His name was floated as a possible candidate. And Laurent Blanc, who played for Barcelona for just one season, 1996-97. But I guess that's enough to have a Barca connection to come back and manage if they really want to do it that way. But I want you to just get into all of it, Frances. Do you really want Setien to continue? Do you think he's going to continue? And where do you think that the Kike Setien experiment has been? I mean, we obviously know it's been a negative, but has it been a complete failure? Can it be salvaged? Okay, um, plenty of questions there to analyze. Um, I'm going to start talking from what my heart tells me. My heart tells me that Setien defends a philosophy that is very closely aligned to what the ideal of Barca is. Um, he is a huge admirer of, of Cruyff, even though he never really played for him, but he played against him for many, many years. Um, when he was coaching in Lugo, but certainly at Las Palmas and then at Betis, he played an attacking way of football that attracted a lot of uh, attention and obviously ultimately granted him the job at Barca. So my heart tells me that a manager that has defended the Barca ideals to the, to the end of the world, because really he, he got um, sacked from Betis because he was playing the Barca way with players that weren't of Barca quality that ultimately caused him to, to be sacked. But in my heart, the right manager to have is someone with those ideals. My head tells me differently. My head tells me that this is a guy that, despite having all of those um, ideals and fantastic formations and mechanisms and, and all sorts of um, ideals in his head, he's not really been able to implement that into reality. And that is despite having um, a fantastic squad. You know, obviously, we're not talking 2009 when you had Dani Alves, Xavi, Iniesta, Puyol, etc. And obviously, a younger, a younger version of Messi as well. Uh, that's not the squad he has. But he's got a more than good enough squad to do much better than he has done. Not only that, I think that and I don't know his little details, but for me, it's very telling when there are cooling breaks, for example. The guy doesn't even talk to his players. And he allows Eder Sarabia, who, who with respect, is, is a nobody in world football. I mean, he wasn't really playing for any big clubs um, in his younger years. And he's coached virtually nobody before. Uh, the same as Etienne, to be honest. But as a second manager, you cannot really have... And, you know, even if he's just for show, you cannot really have the, the world watching and knowing that, you know, there's not even commercial breaks because the, the, the news from most of the Barca football matches in the last month have actually been in these cooling breaks. And the manager just doesn't say anything to anybody. And if he talks to anybody, every time that I've been watching, he's been talking to, um, I don't know, Semedo or Ricky or Ansu or the players that, you know, they're not the, the, the dressing room heavyweights. And in order to lead anything or anybody or any group of people you have to have that personality you have to have that connection um you can be the best uh, tactician in the world unless you've got that personal connection and you can get people to to rally behind you when things turn ugly you're not going to be able to lead any any team in any profession in any business and certainly not in football i was watching i was watching youtube this afternoon i i subscribe to different channels and i don't know how but the Pep Guardiola Amazon special, I think it's called All or Nothing for Manchester City. There was a little clip that came for um, eight minutes and I watched it and it was Pep Guardiola talking to, within the Manchester City dressing room. The guy, and I know that we're comparing him to the greatest, but his connection, his passion, his, um, his knowledge is just, is just through the roof. Um, he's, you know, he was swearing from time to time. You could see there was, there was something there. That you could see there was some energy and the, the players, they were just silent and they were in awe of this genius they had in front of him, just motivating them to be even better. And a manager like Guardiola wins you games. A manager like Klopp wins you games. A manager like um, Simeone wins you games. I don't love him very much, but Mourinho, 10 years ago, won you games and titles. And this is not something that I can see Setien doing. Now, back to the original question. Should Setien be sacked right now so someone comes in in a month's time for the Champions League? 
Well, honestly, I don't think so. I think shaking it up right now is just going to upset the the the, the, the players even more. I mean, it looks like Messi and Setien um, have made up and they, in a way, I think they, they haven't really made up. They just put the differences aside for the benefit of the team. But I think another change right now, it wouldn't really be sufficient. I mean, who are you going to bring? Kloiver hasn't really managed anyone successfully ever. Um, you've got Garcia Pimienta, who would be the choice, but he's obviously busy with the second team. And I think that if you're going to bring Garcia Pimienta, you need to give him longer to, to prepare. So there's no one really that can take over right now. Um, so sticking with Setien has to be the way forward. Now, if you ask me about next year, I think that Setien's credit is finished. Um, I think that it is quite clear that the heavyweights in the dressing room don't necessarily um, align with him. They haven't connected. They certainly haven't connected with Sarabia. And I think that's a no-go situation. Then I think there needs to be a change of manager. And um, well, I think there needs to be a change of board, <laughs> to be honest. I think that Bartomeu just needs to say, all right, I couldn't do any better than this. Someone else comes and, 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 and picks, up, picks it up where I left it. But obviously, he's not going to do that. He's not going to resign. I think he's made that very clear in every single aparición, in every single um, conversation with the media as he's had. So with Martomeu not leaving, I think another year of Setien would be would not take us anywhere better than where we are right now. So bringing an interim manager, I think, makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think to Dirk's question about has the Kike experiment officially failed, you really hit the points tactically, where against Alaves, when they're playing that 3-5-2, not only is that Cruyffian philosophy as far as the three at the back, but Cruyff also played in the way that the, the attack works fluidly and with buildup. But we saw that Barca had great rotation and a number of players were not playing that day. And I think it does reflect on, and this is, again, of no fault of Setien's. He inherited the squad in January that he inherited. I think there is a, it would be potential for Kike Setien's ideas to actually work at FC Barcelona if he was able to mold the squad in his image. But obviously, as you mentioned, Francesca, and you brought up every point that's possible to hit, but the way that these things are interwoven together, that if Kike Setien can't bring in the squad or have a squad that he wants, which with the pandemic, particularly economically, he's never going to be able to make the radical changes and the moves that he's going to need to. Also, again, the power structure of the club, the board and the players hold so much more power than it seems like managers do, unless you're a manager that has won the Champions League and has gained a voice at the club. So Kike Setien, it's a chicken or the egg. Can he succeed if he had the right players and the personnel? Sure, but he's never going to have that because he's never going to win with his players to have the power to do that. So I, I feel like it's a domino effect that he's never going to get far enough to get there. And you bring up the point of as much as I want to say that, yeah, I actually do think tactically he showed that with given the right players and with given the right aptitude and the situation, he can do it. But this is an experienced squad and older heads are going to be the thing that even emotionally drive the club forward. And so KK Setien just, it was bad timing. Uh, I honestly do think that in, in three or two or three years' time, if Kiki Setien became manager of Barca, he would have had a much, much better. I know that's maybe without Messi. I think he, though, in that time, would have had a much better option of succeeding than the current club that he inherited in January and just had to try to radically change something in January, which we know across all of world football works so little of the time. So very, very little of the time. When you change a manager, it's not to win trophies. It's to survive relegation. Right? That's what clubs do. They change their manager in the hopes that that emotional boost of a new voice will get you out of the cellar. But Barca were top of the table, which is, just again, absurd to say. And it is this crazy, I think, an overcorrection where now we're talking about how Ernesto Valverde probably should have finished this season. And again, it's one of those things where things can be true in different ways. That, yeah, Ernesto Valverde probably should have finished this season, but he probably should have been fired after Roma and after Liverpool, and all of those different that's things it. can all be correct. That's it. That's the point. Um, I think that Stoichkov was talking the other day. One of those videos popped up as well. He he said it in a very, <laughs> in a very Risto way, in a very you know black and white. He said Setien is a mediocre manager, and Valverde should have been sacked beforehand. And uh, I can say many more words, but this is this is my feeling too. I think that Valverde should have been sacked in the summer. 
another manager should have, maybe even Setien himself, you know. But obviously, I think that if you sack Valverde at the right time, which was uh, after the debacle in Liverpool um, or after La Copa defeat that came a couple of weeks later, then you've got a manager that hopefully you can get someone of a higher caliber than Setien. But even if it was just Setien himself, then you've got the preseason, you've got um, him having a say on the squad build-up, etc. And you give him a fair chance. I think it's a total shambles. Should Valverde have been sacked when Barca were leading La Liga? Well, I think I think it was the right decision at the time because Barca were not really playing in any any great football at all. They were just playing because the players were fitter than where they were in the last three, four months of the season. And uh, I think that Barca, even if Valverde had stayed, they wouldn't have won the league because I don't think that Barca have lost La Liga in terms of tactics and formations, etc. I think they've lost it because of squad composition, because of the fact that um, I think it's nine and sometimes ten of the starting 11 in pretty much every game is over 30 years old. I mean, you've got Semedo, who is El Yogurin, he's the, the youngster at 25. And then you've got Ter Stegen, I think he's 28, 29. And then everybody else is over 30. I just don't think that a team with that age average is capable of winning any big league in Europe anymore. And I think that um, Bartomeu should have done much more within his power to change that. Granted, there have been injuries. Granted, there have been knocks. But, you know, we've been saying for years, you know, these La Masia players, they're ready to jump up. And Valverde didn't use them well enough at all. I mean, if you think about it, not a single La Masia player made an impact at first team level beyond Sergi Roberto. And, you know, he's not a superstar, but he was the only one that got established. Beyond Sergi Roberto, no one really did anything at first team level. And the mismanagement from Valverde when looking back at La Masia has um, resulted in what we've seen this season. And, you know, we're not very happy with what Setien has done. We're definitely not happy with the results. But to be honest, he has given youth a chance, uh, maybe, granted. Maybe he was just forced into it because of the injuries and knocks, etc. But at least there is some hope. And at least that, you know, Setien was trying to change the formations, get creative and actually make, make things better. So even though the result hasn't been great, I think Setien has, has tried everything that, that he could. But obviously, the whole of the situation and, as I said before, his mismanagement of personalities in the dressing room, I think, are, are going to cost him the job uh, once the season is over. Yeah, I wanted to give him a, uh, Setien a little more credit on the La Masia point that Valverde made a bring, bring up Ansu Fati out of necessity, but Ansu Fati now has had two managers in his 17-year-old year of life and his first season in the Barca first team, and he hasn't really skipped a beat. He's able to keep that going forward. And I also thought, and just seeing Kiki Setien putting out Ricky Puig in his very first match in charge, it showed you what the intent was and the kind of player that he wanted to use from the academy. And again, I, I think it was just wrong man at the wrong time for Kiki Setien. As far as other names being floated out there, I think Kloivert, he's had his issues, but as I actually covered in the YouTube video at La Masia, I actually think there is a lot of talent right now in the at the moment coming up between the ages of basically 17 and 19. You have a lot of really good players that didn't really exist from 20 to 22, if you will. And I think Kloivert has helped to cultivate that talent and, and cultivate what are players that I, I think have a chance. They still have to make improvements and still have to make the big steps up. But I think there's a, a generation that is coming through that is very close. And if things do break right, you could get two or three more players, not just Puj and Fati, but two or three more consistent first teamers out of that batch of what I think is 10 to 12 really, really talented players from the ages of 17 to 19. I think Clover has really helped with that. And I would not want to see him jeopardize that now. And I, there have been ways to criticize Clover with the academy as well. I don't have time to get into those. I think we'll have time in the break to really break down the good and the bad from Clover's time with the academy. But the other name, again, Lauren Blanc, I want to remind you his agent is George Mendez, who likes to really throw things out there and see if they stick. So again, he hasn't coached at the first team level since, well, at all since 2016, back with PSG when he was fired for losing to Man City in the Champions League quarterfinals because he threw out a new formation in the second leg against Man City, which is a crazy thing to do. Uh, sorry, that was back in 2015. So then, yeah, he was let go in 2016. Makes sense. Also, French national team also managed Bordeaux. And again, one season at Barcelona, he has never showed that he supports Barca's style and philosophy in the way that he manages. He manages personnel. He manages a team. And so he's a name that would be a stopgap for one season. Uh, as I said, I think there is great change coming on the horizon at Barca. But as we're going to continue to talk about all summer long, it's just a matter of whether or not that happens or the matter that that's forced or they try to accelerate that even with this current board, 
or whether or not uh, it's just going to be kind of a waiting period until things might radically change. And that is the key issue here. I think that Andres Bartomeu does something that nobody really expects him to do, which is just give up and resign right now and call an election. The next year, I don't want to say it's going to be wasted, but there are so many futures. There are so many players that probably, you know, Alba, Suarez, Busquets, Rakitic, Vidal, Pique. There are so many players that really are on borrowed time already. Um, if the election was called, I think at least half of the players that I just mentioned would be gone. And uh, I think that next year could potentially be very, very difficult because things, unless a miracle happens in terms of Bartomeu just saying, I'm done with this. Um, I think that it's wasted time, to be honest. And uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to call for bad weather, but I, I see next year, unless results are good from the very beginning, being very, very difficult at institutional level. Um, obviously, Messi looked like a broken man and sounded like a broken man uh, once we lost La Liga this year. I cannot even begin to imagine what it would be if he gets someone that basically hasn't coached for four years, like Laurent Blanc or Setien, who the players have already said they don't really like, who the players have clearly shown they're not really showing much support to. Um, if any of those two are in charge of the team and results aren't going greatly, you've got Piquet speaking to the media, sending tweets, you've got Messi already talking to the media this year, it could turn very, very ugly. I just, I really just don't see the point of this annual limbo, which is this year in the middle of nowhere. Um, I really hope it doesn't happen, but... Unfortunately, I think I will be wrong. Yeah, I think the best thing to do to just end this conversation would be to direct our attention to the B team just momentarily. Eric asks, anyone else on the B squad to keep on keep an eye on as a potential fringe first team player for the upcoming season? Damjan asks, what's your opinion on Barca B having beaten Real by the lead B? Can they go all the way without Alex Callado, who's out for, unfortunately for Callado, I don't know if you saw this, but Callado is out with an injury for about three to four months, which not only is it going to make him miss whatever continues of the Barca B promotion, but unfortunately he might miss what is preseason with the first team, which I think is actually devastating to Alex Callado because his only shot, I think, to make the first team next year was to be with the first team during preseason. So again, that is a crushing blow, I think, to him. Uh, but maybe Copa del Rey or down the road, or maybe he didn't send out a lot along, who knows. Uh, then a few other players are missing as well. And then Ira asked, what, how likely is it for Barca B to get promotion? Now, again, tomorrow, they play against CD Badajoz, and Ronald Araujo has traveled and will be with them down in Andalusia for that match. Uh, Barca B are more talented, should beat Badajoz, but to Eric's point, as I'm saying, there is a little bit of a restructuring, as you've heard me say. I, I've talked about Manchu before, but Manchu at this point is still a 20-year-old. He'll be 21 shortly, So, but for next year's squad, if he continues on at Barca B, he'll actually be one of the older ones. He'll be surrounded basically with teenagers, and whether it's the second or third division, we're talking about 19-year-olds, and then there is 20 to 22-year-olds next year, and I think there's a lot of promising talents, and not just the big names you might know, like Conrad De La Fuente, the American, or E.S. Moriba, Hondra Oriana, who I have talked about before, again, Manchu, there's just a lot of different names there, and I think as far as Barca B's promotion chances, I think they do have high chances now with Araujo supporting in defense against Vitalid Bay. There was nothing wrong with the attack. Moriba was good in midfield along with Manchu, and Oriana was playing in the defensive midfield role. And the two issues that Barca had were their center forward, Ray Minaj, looked uh, the Albanian they signed in December. He looked a lot like Luis Suarez as far as his mobility, but unfortunately he's 10 years younger and doesn't really score goals. So I don't know if that paints a picture of what Mijan, or the kind of shift that Minaj kind of put in in that one. I actually would prefer if they went with the 17-year-old Peke or Gerard Fernandez, who's this odd, odd forward. He's very, very tiny. He basically looks like Sergio Aguero if he was on a long-term diet. Basically Sergio Aguero when he was 17. <laughs> uh, really tiny guy. So they went with Minaj just to help with a little hold-up play. And there was a lot going on on the, on the wings attack-wise. Things either ran through the midfield or they ran on that left wing with Conrad De La Fuente. He did. I think he had one of his actually his best match with Barca B because obviously he scored a brace. The most he scored with Barca B so far. He had just one goal before that. Yeah, but he had a really good match. And then the other issue was in the defense where Jorge Cuenca was fine as a left center back. But Mingueza did have his issues. And I've mentioned him before where Chumi was a superior one of the two. Cuenca is a little bit better than him as well. He's getting up to the point where he has to decide whether or not he just wants to be a long-term Barca B player into his mid-20s or he has to maybe even go to a third division team. Unfortunately, he just is not going to be in the first team plans, and Araujo is certainly a major upgrade there. So center back was the other issue they had, 
and I think they've easily upgraded. So I think Garcia Pimienta has a good shot. I think he now has the best team fighting against promotion just as far as the talent. I know there's still some young players, but Danny Moreira, the right back, also had a really, really good game. He's also 22. He's not, as far as the B team, he's not a spring chicken. So he's a talented player, a teammate on the other side. And I think it's no surprise that unlike the first team in a lot of matches, it seems like, especially in the Champions League, Barca B had the superior fullbacks and that made them the superior team. The only worry, again, I have is just the other team trying to overload the midfield. But isn't that an odd thing to say, Frances, that a B team that plays the Barca way, the one worry they really had was that they weren't controlling the midfield. But I, I think that they have the ability to do that now with Araujo back at center back. Well, of course, uh, they were missing Ricky and Ansu. Obviously, we spoke about that at the beginning of the episode, so I'm not going to go over that again. Um, but I think that, you know, once they've got to the, what, what arguably is the semifinals, isn't it? Because they've got this game against Badajoz and right. then the, the, the final game. So they can certainly win two games. I mean, they were very good throughout the whole of La Liga. Um, the absence of Collado as well is going to be a, a huge disadvantage. But, you know, once you've got to the semifinals of any tournament, everything is going to be really, really tight. Um, obviously, Badajoz and all the other teams they play in, they have got a lot more oficio, which is, in a way, translates to know-how. Um, all the players, players that have been playing in Segunda División B forever, some of them playing in Segunda A, and, you know, it's a life-changing decision for them. I mean, if you think about it, Segunda División B is quite professional, but Segunda División A is actually professional. It's Liga de Fútbol Profesional. It actually changes the, 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 the body that embodies the whole competition. And, and these players would just turn just professional. The money is much, much, much higher because obviously TV money comes into place. And this is uh, for players of Badajoz's caliber. It's life-changing for them. It was also, also the same for the Barca B players. But, you know, at 17 to 20, 21 years old, you expect these players to either make it in Barca's first team, very very few will, um, but the others will be able to have a long career, mostly in Segunda División and the better ones in Primera. So the Badajoz players are fighting for their lives and Barca B players are playing for the prestige and obviously to ensure that Barca, one of the biggest clubs in the world, um, has an even narrower gap between the second team and the first team, which is absolutely essential as the lack of that, you know, Generación Relevo, the generation in the middle that we should be having right now we should have the first team with 22 23 24 25 years old and and they're just missing because that gap has been too large over the last four or five seasons and for me it is crucial that this promotion is achieved and i really hope it is yeah i think even uh, it sounds completely trivial but i was watching the match i mean the pitch that they were playing on and for having a playoff and for having all these teams having to send on this uh, similar location for this little mini tournament that pitch was awful and that's like something you have to be reminded too that if you want to go from basically a back somebody's backyard in the third division and I, that, I'm, I'm being a little too harsh but some of those pitches are rough in the third division and then you're jumping up to play on the camp no I mean that's a big step and that's some getting used to so just being able to play in the second division and then being able to go on into the likes of Zaragoza or some of those bigger clubs or Sporting Gijon and Real Oviedo these clubs that are in the second division sure but they're a accommodations are befitting of players that are preparing for the first team and sometimes mentality is also important there too and I also the final point I want to add is that Mateus Pereira who came over on loan for the Alejandro Marquez deal in December or January rather he actually made his Barca B debut his paper his international paperwork was finally done and so he was able to make his debut and he made it on the right wing he's an attacking midfielder playing out of position just like Callado, and he just basically did a Callado impression. So that's not a name. If you hear that, if he has a big match against uh, against Badajoz or in potentially a final that Barca B makes, uh, that's just a name that is probably going back to Juventus shortly. And if Barca buy him, it's not to make the first team. So anyway, I guess there's no point in telling you about a name to throw out. But one of the names that we shouldn't throw out or can't throw out just yet is how we're going to end the show. A question from Tobias. Quite simply, is it me or is Suarez a little underappreciated? Ha ha ha. A very, very, very good question. Um, is he underappreciated? No, I don't think so. I think that I think that any one of our listeners um, knows that Suarez is a world-class talent um, that has scored plenty of goals, nearly 200 goals now. He's in the top three uh, best goal scorers of Barca history, so passing people like Croy, Maradona, etc. And... Um, Eto'o, Rivaldo, Romario, obviously many of those, Stoichkov. 
And no, I don't think he's underappreciated. I think that people really understand that Suarez is a fantastic player that has given a lot to the club. Obviously, Luis Suarez um, has been at the center of lots of criticism, and I think it's deserved, to be honest. I think that Suarez should be able to give more than what he's given. And if he's not Suarez himself, he's anyone who plays uh, center striker at Barca today or in any given year, to be honest, should be offering more than what Suarez is offering right now. Um, you cannot fault his goal-scoring olfato, his goal-scoring ability. That's always going to be there. And uh, it is clear that, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be too harsh, but he can hardly run around the pitch and he's scoring either, you know, world-class top corner strikes or just looking as clumsy as my lamp is looking in front of me right now. So it is... It is um, it's, it's Marmite, isn't it? It's uh, Vegemite, Marmite, all put together. It's black and white. He's either incredible or it looks like he learned to walk yesterday. And, and that, is, um, that is the polarizing uh, figure that uh, Luis Suarez is today. Obviously, it links to what we were saying before. Um, Suarez should really be playing a, a bench role today or this season even, um, coming on for the last 30, 35 minutes and actually making an impact. But if you're using him for 90 minutes, today and in three days time again and in three days time again and in three days time again and you do that consistently when the guy has just recovered from you know a, a long-term injury let's not forget and um, he's playing every single second as if he was a spring chicken when the, obviously you're going to destroy the guy so uh, should do I think that Luis Fares should have been given more yes do I think that Setien didn't organize his minutes properly absolutely are fans right to expect more from Suarez of course so I don't know if I answered the question no, I think you did. And I think that it is difficult. And this is across all sports where when father times comes and these all time legends have sharp declines, as I said at the beginning, 16 goals in the Liga is his lowest output since he played half of that time in his first season. He has been extraterrestrial, just like Messi, as far as putting the ball on the back of the net. And even in the Liga this season, he had the best goal average in the Liga after Messi, as Tobias pointed out. As I said at the beginning, when I was reading off those stats about Messi, that that he had he was on the top five in assists, he was a top five in goals in the Liga. But I think as far as this is not a knock on Luis Suarez as much as it is, can he be replaced? I do think those 16 goals can be replaced by somebody else, where Messi is just so different. And the way that Barca play, and you're looking now injecting a Ricky Puj, or even the way that Sergio Busquets can orchestrate from a deep line position, that... Barca are going to have, they, I think you can find a forward that can hit 16 to 20 goals. I, I think that they, that player exists in the world. It's not just Lautaro Martinez, and obviously Barca need to be paying a lot to make it feel like you've got a player that's worth the price tag, because you know that any team is going to price scout it's Barca. But as Suarez is declining, and I, again, this I don't think it's underappreciating him, is that yes, he scores goals, but I do think if you plug somebody else in there, that he, he might not score as beautiful goals as Suarez, but he's also going to press a lot more and he's going to run and cover a lot more space and he's going to make goals easier for Barca to score. And that means more goals for that player. And they don't have to be Galazos. And that's not a disservice again to Suarez. It's that I, I just think that at this, as you said, at this point in his career, especially on those knees. So whatever age he is, add five years or 10 years to his knees because that is what he's currently operating under when you just have a guy who's played so many minutes. And you're absolutely right about that. So the big question is going to be the same one we'll talk about all summer, is that can Barca replace his goal output with the amount of money that they have in their war chest? That's actually the challenge. It's not whether or not well, I, someone can physically replace him. It's whether or not they have enough money in the war chest to find a way to replace him. I think that if you put Griezmann at center striker and you give him as many minutes as Suarez has had this season by the injury, I think Griezmann can return the 15, 16 goals as Suarez has scored and certainly right. do the do the assist as well. And if you push it, I think even Braithwaite, you put Braithwaite there for 90 minutes every match for the whole season, he does score more than 16 goals. So I don't think it is impossible to replace him. Obviously, it is impossible to replace when you're listening to everything that Messi says and you don't have the guts as a manager to just sit him down uh, because you don't want the, the rest of the heavyweights in the dressing room to complain. That is the problem. Having Suarez in the squad is not the problem. Having Suarez dictating how many minutes he has to play is. But then again, that all goes back to the manager. And then if you want to go deeper, it goes back to very poor um, squad management like we've already mentioned today. Yeah, right. It's like any other player. And just because Luis Suarez seems like a little bit of a bully on the pitch, where I, I noticed I marked out in the Alaves game, and in the 10th minute, 
Fatih took a, a shot from a, a difficult angle, and Luis Suarez was making an overlapping run, and Suarez really let the teenager have it. But that meant that Suarez was going to have an even harder angle, and there was nobody with a far post run, but Suarez is one of those players, and it's like every center forward. It was funny, I was saying to my wife that every world-class center forward is probably kind of a jerk, and you kind of just have to accept that. And so don't take of what we see of Suarez as indicative of the, what he does on the field. In the same way that it's much harder to get a guy that seems stubborn, that seems like he won't be moved, it seems a lot harder to, with that kind of a big personality, to put him in his place. And that's why so many times Zlatan Ibrahimovic is one of the greatest strikers ever, but it's been a lot easier for managers to move on from him, to go into a new, new direction and say thank you for your service, than it was to keep him around as he continued to age. And I think that's going to, again, be another issue with Suarez, that as he is, I mean, whether he wants to stay for another season or two, what is a manager going to be able to do with him as he continues to age, is he going to take a bench roll? Some superstars, some legends, it just doesn't work for them. And even Xavi and Iniesta, the way that they were kind of phased out, they probably still could have been starters in those seasons that they were being phased out. And Puyol had his injuries as well. And Suarez, if he just continues to start all the time, then maybe he just has to leave the club and be a starter at the age of 34 or 35 somewhere else. So those are, again, big questions. We're going to continue to talk about Lee Suarez and the center forward, uh, I want to say, hole in the future. That's going to have to be replaced before almost anything else. But we'll worry about that on a future show. So just doing the math here, I think we have about two shows between now and Napoli. So there's going to be plenty more to talk about before we even get to the Champions League. We're going to be previewing that and, and breaking that down at nauseum, both physically, tactically, and most importantly, I think, with the Champions League, Frances, emotionally. So continue to tune back in for the Barcelona podcast as we gear up for Champions League action. So I want to thank you again for tuning in. You can tap in your app, check out the show notes to subscribe, find us on social media or on Twitter at the Barcelona pod, at LTND13 for me on Instagram at the Barcelona pod, that closed Facebook group where we got these listener questions from tbpod.link backslash group, also deeper dive and discussions on Patreon, tbpod.link backslash Patreon. I want to thank all the new patrons that have joined, especially in this quarantine, in this time of uncertainty. I really, again, I really, really appreciate it and it is what helps me continue to make these shows now and we are also as you know on youtube we're doing well over there producing some special content so that's the barcelona podcast over there check us out and hit that subscription button but thanks so much for listening to this the barcelona podcast until next time we'll talk to you soon forza barca forza